just want to take uh, the next few moments and just uh, reflect and recap and just kind of give some perspective on what we believe that the Lord uh, did this week. And um, before we do that, I just want to introduce the panel. We got David Bradshaw over here. He's, he's the, um, the founder and the, the director of Awaken the Dawn, and which is a real significant part of just really pushing for several things that actually happened this week, which we'll talk about in just a few moments. We've got Francis Chan over here. And uh, Francis gives leadership to Crazy Love, and it's also part of the SEND team and, and whatnot. And we got Dean Bai. And uh, Dean is the founder and the leader of Return Ministries that just focuses on training and equipping people to help with the whole Alia movement. And him and his wife, Patty, just moved to Kansas City. And so they are going to be based here and operating from here, and you'll be seeing them and hearing about, from them a bunch. And then we have Asher and Trader. And many of you know Asher, he gives leadership to Revive Israel and a focus on evangelism, both with the Arab community and the Jewish community and so forth. And then we've got our illustrious pastor over here. Oh, <laughs> illustrious. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, if, you, if you have your Bible with you, just serve with me for a moment to Romans chapter 11, verse 13. I, I cannot start a discussion without a Bible verse. I can't help myself. <laughs> but uh, Romans 11, 13, 14, it's a, a very critical passage. It's a passage that's been on my mind um, as we have been, as the, as the events from this week has been unfolding. And the Apostle Paul says that he is an apostle to the Gentiles. And when I think about that, I think of that as him being an apostle to us, as predominantly Gentiles. And therefore, him as a father, an apostolic father to the Gentiles, there's a DNA that's in him that he is seeking in that time to impart to the Gentile community and I believe that, that the Holy Spirit is doing that very same thing um, in our day, and it's, it is only going to increase. And here's what he says. He says that he seeks to magnify his ministry among the Gentiles in order to provoke the Jews to jealousy. And I believe that part of what was happening this week was just the beginnings of that assembly. And, and again, the Lord is doing this all across the earth. I'm just talking about, uh, about our little context here that there was this assembling, this the beginnings of this assembling of this divine provoker for the, uh, for the restoration and the salvation of the Jewish people. Later on in uh, verse uh, 26, he talks about the fullness of the Gentiles coming in. And Mike spoke about this thing called the fullness of the Gentiles last Tuesday. And there, and there are several components to this. It's, it is the fullness of the number, this, this billion so harvest, it is the fullness of, 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 uh, of unity. It is the fullness of the understanding of the gospel narrative. And so there's various components that are a part of it. And I believe that I saw some seeds of those components uh, being established um, in our midst here with, uh, over the course of the last week. I've just been so uh, touched by what the Lord, I could not agree more with Isaac and, and, and Morgan just how the sense of strength that you all um, have brought to us. I just, again, I just want to thank the Awaken the Dawn team. Thank you so much. The Send. And, and, and one of the things that I have been touched by personally is just how you have contended and believed for promises related to this city as though they are your own. And, and my prayer for you is that the Lord would just release an impartation of that to you as you go back uh, to your cities. Because before this whole thing is over, uh, the gospel is going to touch all the nations of the earth, all the cities of the earth, all the peoples of the earth with power and glory. And so, so thank you so much. Because, again, as I've talked with different ones from our leadership team and our, and our staff, there's different, it, all I've expressed is a sense of strengthening and refreshing that they have felt. I really feel that this week was about a couple things. One, it was about strengthening intercession. Not just, not just intercession in terms of IHOP because there's prayer meetings all across the city, but there are those who have been believing for the promises of God concerning the Church of Kansas City. And I believe that what we saw this week was the Lord saying, you know what, I'm gonna give you some tokens because I'm serious about the things that I spoke over the last several decades as far as the purposes and the promises of God. 
A couple of things that were a highlight to me that, that one, I want to bring up. One thing was that I mentioned that the, the fullness of the Gentiles, it is the fullness of the narrative, it is the fullness of the, the harvest, and it's the fullness of unity. One of the things that Bob Jones spoke about back in the 80s was that, was that part of the thing that the Lord wants to do is he wants to do something amongst black believers as far as the placement within the context of the body of Christ. This is not about honor. This is not about woke. This is not about, it's, what, it's got nothing to do with that. It simply has to do with the fact that God has specific assignments for different people groups. And he has an assignment for the black community. He spoke about prophetically. And one of the things that I saw this week, and I've personally been, been in the kingdom for over 30 years, been in ministry for, uh, for, for about 30 years, and I've never seen this. I got to witness this group called Black Voices, that's, uh, <laughs> it's under the leadership of Yasmin Pierce and, and Michael. They, they, they belong with the circuit writers at YWAM. And about a year ago, does the Lord uh, begin to move um, on them in a very, very, very powerful way. And as just, just, uh, just, just several hundred uh, black young adults begin to get touched with a burden for the revelation of Christ and a burden for the gospel, and so I was uh, actually myself and other leaders, Mike, were with them on Wednesday just to kind of hear their story. And the focus on Christ and the focus on the gospel was absolutely remarkable. And then, we, uh, and then I got together with them on, on, uh, on Thursday night. There was four to 500 of them for one single purpose, for the fame of Christ's name and for the spread of the gospel. And the reason why that's so significant, and I don't mean any negativity to this, I just want to point to the, to the holiness and the significance of it, that I have never been a part of a group like that where the sole purpose is Christ and his gospel. Usually it's Christ and his gospel plus, and the plus is what it is, but the idea of having a Christ and his gospel, I mean, it was nothing but remarkable to see that. And so, but I just think that that just kind of happened in our midst, and I think it's part of the storyline because of what the Lord has spoken about the black community. Secondly, on Tuesday that we had our, literally our first prayer meeting for Israel on the Truman property. And, uh, and again, it was uh, Dean Bai here and, and, and uh, David Bradshaw that were really, were really, really pushing for this. Uh, some of us, myself included, were going, well, okay, let's do it, but, uh, but man, it just landed just right. And it, and it ended up being, I believe, again, a token from the Lord because he spoke 40 years ago that one of the purposes of the Truman property was the leading of intercession for Israel, and check this out, and that it would touch Asia, and they would watch through uh, uh, unplugged TV sets. We had a 1,000 Chinese that tuned in through the web stream that were praying along with us on Tuesday morning as they're praying for this first prayer meeting for Israel. And so, and so the divine poetry of what the Lord is doing, I mean, Isaac said earlier, he said, he said I cannot take any more poetry. He says, I'm, I'm poeted out. I mean, I mean, the Lord has just really gone out of his way. And I want to just mention the second thing is that I just, for me personally, I just feel like part of what the Lord was doing this week, he just wanted us to be astonished. Just to be simply be astonished at what it is that he is doing and what it is that he is going to do. And so... Anyway, so there you have it. Those are just some of my thoughts. But, but David, uh, share a little bit what you're thinking, how you view this week, and some of the things the Lord's been highlighting to you. Yeah, I, you know, as I'm processing the last week, it was remarkable. I, I agree that the divine poetry, I mean, we haven't even been able to share all of it publicly. It's so overwhelming, the kiss from the Lord of just his sense of favor and grace to move his purposes forward through a week, yes. Um, but one of the things that, that stands out to me probably as much as anything when I look back on the last week between all the Truman property events and then of course the send at the stadium was just this Malachi 4 verse 5 and 6 this purpose of God to turn the hearts of fathers to children and children to fathers and the the reality that the Lord is insisting on some DNA points in this next generation I think when I look at what's happening, I see the Lord discipling the next generation, especially in some values, many of which this house has pioneered for, for the nations. And when I look at what happened, I think young adults, Gen Z, is now being discipled in a significant way in values that this house has fought for. And I believe that that happened this week in a profound way. So 
in, in spite of all the, the stadium and the activities and the events, I see the Lord sovereignly working. And uh, I loved what Mike said in the stadium, uh, the Song of Solomon 8, 6, the invitation to intimacy. And even looking at what happened on the Truman property, there was, a, there was an encounter, an invitation for intimacy with God in the next generation. But in that journey, the Lord is going to begin to draw them into some of these values and messaging that the Lord has given the body of Christ at large in this house specifically. And uh, this morning we were reflecting on just my own journey. You know, the, the entry point is often just this hunger for the presence of Jesus, the knowledge of God, and God's awakening a generation to his beauty and to the centrality of the knowledge of God and the person of Jesus. And I think we saw that happening throughout the whole week. And and I think that's the entry point. You never graduate from it, but I remember even in my own journey how we started doing day and night prayer just rooted simply in hunger for more Jesus, more of his presence, more of the knowledge of God. There really was no thought really about the Great Commission even, and definitely no thought about Israel not even on the radar. We got in because we were so hungry for the presence of Jesus because we'd been awakened in love, like Mike was talking about, Song of Solomon 8, 6. The fire of love was coming on our hearts, but in that journey in, God then began to disciple us in his purposes, and specifically his purposes for Israel. I remember uh, we, we were doing day and night prayer for the first time, and this was the root system of Awaken the Dawn, the kind of the birthing of it, And right in the middle of it, a friend of mine has this dream, this unusual dream from the Lord, where she walks up to my house, and there's an angel in the living room in the dream, and he says three sentences to her in this dream, and the last one is, tell David Bradshaw to pray for Israel. I had no thought of praying for Israel. All I wanted was more Jesus. I discovered the pearl of great price and we were going hard. If 200 kids were saved in my city, I would have been thrilled. No thought of Israel and, and that she has this dream. So I think I prayed for Israel once, you know? Okay, Lord, I have no idea what you're talking about. Bless Israel. Fast forward a few weeks, another friend comes, says, hey, I don't know why, why this happened, but I wanna share with you this dream. And I heard the Lord say three sentences And she says the exact same three sentences. And the last one is, tell David Bradshaw to pray for Israel. We we weren't thinking about Israel. We were thinking about revival in America and we were thinking about more of God's presence. And in that place of intimacy, the Lord awakened us to his purposes. And, And I believe that is happening and that the Lord is insisting on that in this next generation. And some of what happened this week was God establishing that DNA in the hearts of maybe 80% of the people in that tent had never even thought about about God's purposes for Israel. Never even on their radar, and God exposed them to it. And I'm just thankful for Jesus' amazing leadership to do that, so. You got something? Go please, go ahead. Yeah, just when David, when you were talking about Malachi 4 and the hearts of the fathers turning to the children, and the children of the fathers. You know, I think what we're seeing is we're seeing the Lord raise up sons without envy and ambition, and we're seeing fathers, you know, I think of Mike and Lou and Francis, the real, real old guys. They put the young guys on the stool. I just wanted Francis to just not. No, but. (laughs) But we're seeing fathers that don't find their identity in the Just so you know, this is getting ministry. recorded and it will be viewed about 15 years from now when you will be the old guy. <laughs> this, this, thing is gonna, this thing is gonna have a 15 year boomerang on you and anyway, I just wanna point that out. <laughs> I'm not keeping score, but that's the second time you've done this to me now. You called me <laughs> illustrious earlier, now you're doing this. Anyways, I want people to hear this point. This is a good point that I'm making. No, listen. The Lord's raising up sons without envy or ambition. And I see this in guys like David Bradshaw and Andy Bird and just many. These guys, they're they're not in it for them. They're not trying to build and promote their thing and get everybody to come to their thing. Then there's fathers who are not finding their identity in their ministry and in their mission. They're going, I'm trying to give this thing away. 
I'm trying to empower the, other, the next generation. I'm trying to give as much away as I possibly can. And when I'm, you know, as a son, when I'm hearing fathers like that, and there's not an identity and this drivenness about this is my thing and don't you dare mess up the thing that I made, my heart turns to the fathers and I honor them and I love them. And Asher, I mentioned this earlier, you're, you're such a spiritual father to this movement, this ministry in this house and you've been to me as well from afar. And I'm just so grateful that God is doing, this is a supernatural work of God in our generation. I, I just had to throw in that point. Dean, why don't you share some of your thoughts? Can somebody say 100 million intercessors for Israel? This has been a, a sobering week for me, if I can be just straight out. What a high coming from Canada here and to work with David and y'all to establish uh, the Israel tent on the Truman land and, and just to sense such a, a privilege to be able to enter into this remarkable story. All of you at High Hop here in Kansas City have kept alive for over 40 years I just say thank you. Thank you that I could do my little itty bitty part in this story with our team. But I have to tell you, today is that season of time between almost 2,000 years ago, what have been the Feast of First Fruits or the resurrection of Jesus Christ, and the seven weeks that would lead us to Pentecost or Shavuot. And we are on the 30th day. Jewish people count the Omer, okay? They count a barley sheaf every day, waving it before the Lord, looking for the weed harvest that's ahead. And, um, and, I, and I, I'm looking for that weed harvest. I'm looking for the fruit harvest, actually, that goes on beyond. I'm, I'm longing and I'm yearning for this. And after Mike spoke out of Romans 11, how many people heard that message, Romans 11, that Mike Bickle shared? I'll tell you, if you didn't, go back to the recordings. It's so deep. And, and we just watched the people come to the Israel tent over the next few days to pray, to intercede. Nine-year-old girls weeping. And, and there was something that the revelation was given. Now, when Jesus walked in that resurrected state for the 40 days before he would ascend to be on the right hand of the Father, it's recorded. Two major messages that impact me is one, he needed to give it in the Galilee, and it was on a mountain and it would be called the Great Commission. And many of you have represented that commission. Many of you even here today and listening in, you've gone out with that commission, God bless you. And yet, as those disciples would walk back to Jerusalem from the Galilee, there was a question that burned in their heart. They've just been commissioned in a deep way. They're on their way back to Jerusalem. They're going to go to another mountain, the Mount of Olives. And, and, and there's a question that's burning within them. Will they give it up? Will they ask the master? It would be one of the last words that they would be able to speak to him before he ascended. They'd say, Psst, is it now time? Is it now time to restore the kingdom to Israel? This was the question that burned on Jewish hearts. They thought, I, it's like even myself, 
this week with an Israel tent, with a big stadium at Arrowhead, with her. Is it now time? I'm here to tell you, it is time to favor Zion. It is time. That time has come to favor Zion. And I want to tell you, David, what you're saying about the Generation Z. I'm seeing this oneness. Are you getting this? This oneness between those two resurrection messages. Coming together as one. The Great Commission. And the question they longed to have an answer. Is it now time? We are the generation that that answer is for. It is now time to favor Zion. And my sense is Generation Z is going to know the Great Commission. They won't just believe. They will obey. God is raising up obeyers in this hour. And they're going to be connected to understand the times that we're in, the most exciting times since the resurrection of Jesus Christ, as he returns his people and restores that land called Israel, all in preparation for his return to rule and reign on a throne in an earthly Jerusalem. Can somebody give it up for Jesus? Father, we ask you, Lord, that even now, Lord, that you would, would touch our hearts. Lord, that you would touch our minds. Lord, you spoke through your servant Paul that it, is, that it was your desire, Lord, that we would not be ignorant concerning the mystery. And Father, we ask you, Lord, this morning, Lord, that you would release an increase of Holy Spirit insight, Father, on our hearts, on our minds. Father, I ask you that you would open up the word Father, I ask you, Lord, that even in conversations, Father, about your purposes for Israel, Lord, we ask you for that spirit of revelation, Lord, to be released on us, Father, even now, Lord, in an increased way. Lord, we thank you, Lord, that you are inviting us, Lord, into a thing that is so near and dear to your heart. And Father, we ask you, Lord, that even for dreams, Lord, in the night, Lord, I pray Psalm 16, verse 3, is it where David says, my heart will instruct me in the night. Father, I pray, Lord, for the experience, Lord, where even in the night, our heart is talking to us, Father, concerning this mystery in Jesus' name. Even as Stuart's praying, there's a verse in Isaiah 50, verse 4, where it says that he opened my ear morning by morning so that I would speak a word to the weary one. And right now, as he's praying, if you felt a tingling on your ears. I know that's kind of a bizarre thing to ask, but if you felt a tingling on your ears, I want to just have you raise your hand, or if you feel that now, just raise up your hand. There's a specific anointing that the Lord's releasing. Lord, I ask that you would release it to open the ear and loose the tongue of the learned one, that they would speak a word to the weary who is the Jewish remnant and the people of Israel I believe prophetically that the Lord is gonna use you and he's gonna give you understanding to speak a word, Isaiah 40, of comfort, comfort my Amen. people, and to proclaim the coming of the one who will rule in Zion. So Lord, do it. Open the ear of understanding in Jesus' name. Amen, amen. Well, Francis or Asher, either one of you, anything. Go ahead, Francis. No, no, please. Uh, Francis, go ahead. I came here to listen to you. I seriously did. <laughs> there you go. Just say to the Jew first. Yeah, oh, well, there you go. To the Jew first, and then the, the Chinaman. <laughs> okay, all right, all right, all right. That's good. We'll close with the. Um, towards the end of um, yesterday. You know, Andy, I'm sitting by him all day, and he just 
this is just saying whatever you discern from the Lord, go for it. And there wasn't a lot, um, you know, when communion happened and I just had this fear of do people understand the seriousness of First Corinthians 11 that you can die from taking communion. This is New Testament. Get up there, warn them. Okay. And then later in the day, I, I told him, I go, you know, this day's been rushed. We, we, we said a lot. And I believe the Lord's going to use a lot of that. And I know we've got an agenda and we've got to get out by a certain time, but I feel like he wants us to wait on him and to be quiet. And we can be quick to speak and slow to listen. And waiting on the Lord in this generation is very difficult in a time when you want answers immediately, you know? And, you know, I wasn't even supposed to be here and just, you know, I realized, oh, I do have a gap. Mike had asked me yesterday, so I'm texting while I'm speaking at another prayer breakfast thing. And, you know, oh, yeah, I could I maybe get there by 11. Okay, you know, I was like, wait, what's it's taking them two minutes to get back to me? You know, like, am I coming or not? Like, <laughs> in that type of situation, this is a world we live in and the ability to wait and to be quiet before the Lord which I believe he wants from us. This is an act of worship to be quiet and to just tremble and not feel like I need to tell God what to do next and what I expect from him. And it is, uh, you know, and I, I see that. I, I love that verse in the book of Job where Job finally realizes because he had a clear view of God that he says, I'm just going to put my hand over my mouth because I've been rattling stuff for 35 chapters with my friends. And sometimes the most worshipful thing we can do is just sit at his temple and gaze at his beauty. And I, we have to get better at that. There's a be still and know that I am the Lord, I will, I will, I'm, I'm going to exalt myself. Incense in my name will be burned in every place, a pure offering. So I will do that. And sometimes, especially our generation, we need to learn to be quiet and just sit and stare and that would be the most worshipful thing we could do. And we're losing that. And I, no knock on anyone last night, but, and, and it's hard in a stadium event and everything else, but you just saw the wrestle of, let me see if we can do two minutes of silence. And we couldn't do it. Some did, but we really didn't pull it off. And it shows me how difficult it is to do the very thing, which is the one thing you know, to just sit in his temple and gaze at his beauty without saying anything and just recognizing him in heaven. And I don't have to say anything. I just need to posture myself and be still and understand whose presence I'm in. And I think last night was showing us um, we're not real good at that. Uh, my daughter at a Christian university, their assignment a couple years ago was just be silent for seven minutes in the presence of God. And she said, Dad, people could not do it. None of my friends were making it through. They go, seven minutes of quiet? This is the gen in a Christian university? This is the world we're living in. And so I, I just... I feel like that message is for us in this room. We're used to a lot of stimulation, even amidst the brethren and in our gatherings, that we need to learn to be quiet and wait upon the Lord again. Asher. Asher, please. Amen.
Thank you, Francis. Hallelujah. I felt, uh, as what you were saying, that uh, the Holy Spirit's been speaking to us through this panel right now about God restoring his family, turning the hearts of the fathers to the sons, turning the hearts of the sons to the fathers. There's something God is doing all over the world, which is restoring the father's family. I don't want to talk about that just for a moment and then pray for it. Uh, as I do as part of that, as a little demonstration, I have a few special people here with me today. If you could stand up for just a moment. My wife, Betty, my son, Yeheskel, my daughter-in-law, Odelia, and their four children, Ishai, Ron, Lili, Atelet. And if I could, I just want to honor you, Chesi, for being such a great dad. What I'm teaching now, I think I've learned from you. But, you know, when you, when we come to know the Lord, you not only get saved, you enter into something. And you don't enter into an organization. You don't enter into a building. You enter into a family, a spiritual family. Uh, that's an easy slogan to say. I mean, everybody's saying that slogan recently. But the reality of us really becoming a family and becoming a global family, I almost feel it's being advertised so much around the body because it's so not true. You know, people advertise what they don't have to pretend that they have it so they can. Wow. <laughs> but I was thinking about this, that, that it, of all the prayers we pray in the Bible, I can't think of anything higher than the John 17 prayer. You know that. That we would become one with the Father. And as we become one with the Father, we become one with one another. And you realize that we are all joining into one body of people, one family. That's so simple to say that. But actually, when you look at the body of Christ around the world, and you've got Chinese, you've got Arabs, you've got Jews, you've got blacks, you have whites. I mean, you have, you have tremendous racial difficulties. None of us are racist, if you know Jesus. But you carry in with you racial pride. And it interferes with it. And you, and you think what is being one is what you have. And to come out of that and actually become one with the whole body is an amazingly difficult thing to do. And I realize that, that perhaps those who have been most guilty of doing this wrong are we Jews. Because we set our faith up as, it's that we bless the Lord that God has chosen us instead of all the other people of the world. And that's, that's our, our concept of religion is that we're better than other people. I'm saying that as a Jew myself. I'm not criticizing the Jews. I'm, I'm repenting for our attitude that we're all one, but actually we're a little bit better than everybody else. But that's, and, and I realize what a, <laughs> what a barrier that is. You know, what a barrier that is. And we talk about Jewish roots, and uh, I thank you that some of my brothers here have pushed the, the Jewish agenda for me today. I don't need to do it. But I want, I want to come back when I think about going back to the first root of our faith. You go back to Abraham. And who was this man, Abraham? And God called him Abraham to be the father of many nations. Of all who believe, Jew and Greek. And I realize, here's how I interpret it. You don't have to see it this way. But I believe that God looked out over history for all human beings, and he found the person that had the most character quality of being a daddy. And he chose him, he said, you, you, you're going to be the one. You're going to be the father of many nations. And what did he do? He made him wait a hundred years so that his fathering desire was going crazy. Are you understanding me? Now, this is a Middle East tribal mentality. He's not talking about the global church. You understand what I'm saying? He's talking about he, he wants my son 
And he says, I don't want, I don't want servants. I, don't want, I want to know, where is my son? He's looking for a tribal identity. And as I interpret that, God is saying, look, I will give you that. But first, you need to have my heart as your heavenly father, that everybody in the world, these are all my children. And when you have a heart, my f- heavenly father's heart for all the human race, then I'll let you have your child. And I'm going to push you for a hundred years until you are so desirous of this. And then I'm going to change your name to be a father of many nations. And he got it. And God said to him, I'll make a covenant with you that through you all the nations of the world will be blessed. Where did we lose that? That's, our, that's supposed to be our calling. We've totally missed it. I'm sorry. Not just, not just the Jewish people in general, but are we even Messianic Jews. We've missed that. God wants to bless the nations. To give up our identity and come and be a blessing to the nations. And I, I believe God wants us to be a family together. Listen, you know, who, you know this verse as well in another prayer from Ephesians 3. It says, I bow my knee to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, Yeshua the Messiah, from who the whole family, both in heaven and earth, is named. And he said, Abraham, I want you to be a father. Oh, let's put it this way. God is the father, not Abraham. But Abraham to be a father figure and the first covenantal father of the family. Now listen to this. In that prayer, he said, the father of our Lord Jesus, from who the whole family is named. This is amazing. In Greek, the word for father is pater, and the word for family is patria. What is a family is what comes out of the father. And you think of all the names of God. El Shaddai, powerful one. Adonai, this, the one with authority. But, but above all, he is a father. And his heart is hurting. That his family, his beloved children, his family's been destroyed. And that's what he's saying. I want this to be the last calling. Turn the hearts of the fathers to the sons and the hearts of the sons to the father. I want to, I want to restore my family. And God wants to restore us as a family. One last thing, and then I want to pray for you with that. You know, I began to see that, interestingly enough, in my relating with Christian Arabs. And with some of my friends, David Demin and Basim Adranli and others. And I began to see in the Arab culture, if you get to know them, particularly Christian Arabs, have a tremendous heart of family, hospitality, food. And I looked at them, I said, I'm learning how to be what a family is from you as Christian Arabs. And I realized that, just one more little uh, word play here. The word for family in Hebrew, have you ever heard this, mishpacha? What does it come from? It comes from the word shifcha, which is handmaiden. And there is a person who is the handmaiden in the Bible. Do you know who it is? It's Hagar. It's Hagar. And from her identity, there's a gifting, I believe, in the Arab community, in the Christian Arab community, to bring the feel of being a family back. Can you hear that I'm saying that in humility? Because we Jews always want to take, you know, credit for everything. But, but I've learned that from them. But we, there's something here about a family that's coming out of the tribal sense of the Middle East. And the, and, the, and the Christian Arabs have held that. Maybe we Jews were supposed to, but we sinned. We betrayed the Lord. We were punished for 2,000 years. We lost it. We're coming back, and we're having to learn who we're supposed to be from the beginning. But I believe that God has called us to be a family together. Now, he said, the family that's in heaven and on earth. Of course, that means that those who believe in Yeshua have already died, and they're in heaven and those who also who are on the earth. But I think it also means this, that this family is a heavenly family and an earthly family. Amen. We have a, a, a universal spiritual identity that we are sons of our Father in heaven through Yeshua the Son. But we also have an earthly identity. Every national group 
God said to be a blessing to every nation. You are to preserve your national identity. God made Asians to be Asians and Africans to be Africans and Arabs to be Arabs and Jews to be Jews. And we, we preserve that. It gets born again. And we come in, we become a covenantal tribal family. We're, we're all one together and we have a heavenly identity and an earthly identity and we come together as a family. And I believe this could have never happened until the gospel went all the way to Asia and started coming back now to the Middle East. So this is the first time you've ever had believers in every nation of the world and Christian Arabs and Messianic Jews. This has never happened until this time. And so I believe that God wants us to be a family together. And I want to pray this for us, and I want to just offer that to you. And I say, we, I, we want to be part of your family, your spiritual family with the Heavenly Father, but also who we are as a family of people. We want to be part of you. And we want you to be part of our family. I don't know if you can hear an echo just a little bit of the heart of Abraham as a father. Just reaching out, embracing. You saw have my family. But reaching out, embracing. The, the, we're all a family together. And it goes back to that first covenant with Abraham. And Sarah and Hagar and Isaac and Ishmael. And then it, it grew out from there. And I believe God wants to restore us as a family together. And I want to be part of your family. And I want to ask you to be part of my family. That you are joined into the people of Israel. And we are joined into the ecclesia. We, are, we become one family together. And I believe that nothing could make our Heavenly Father's heart happier than this. And I think of Jesus. I said one last thing. That was a trick. One last thing. <laughs> this is the one last thing, really. Now, the one last thing, when I look at Jesus, and you, some of you who know me have heard me say this before, that Jesus is the head of the church, and he's the king of Israel. Hallelujah. Head of the church and the king of Israel. But you know what? More than that, more than that, he's the son of God. Because he's the son of God who the Father has sent to bring the other children back to him and to restore his family, greater than being the head of the church, greater than being the king of Israel. He's the son of the Father who has come to restore his family to him. So I want to pray, if I could, for us to be one family. Did you want to say something, Mike? I love you. I love you too, brother. Amen. Can we maybe just stand up for a second and let's pray? Hallelujah. Why does it come closer to me? Just got to hold somebody here. Won't I? <laughs> Hallelujah. Father, this is also a time that's come. A time, Father, we feel your heart as a daddy has been hurting for centuries, for millennia. That your family has been destroyed. And you made a covenant with Abraham. You said, go out and restore my family. Be a father figure. Not just to your own family, but to the nations of the world. And he said, now I'm going to send my son, Yeshua, Jesus Send him to the world to save sinners from eternal damnation, but to bring them back into my family, to restore the Father's family. Yeshua, we follow you this day, not only as our Savior and our King, but we follow you as the Son. You as the perfect Son, we follow in your footsteps to give honor to our Heavenly Father and to become one Family together. Father, I'm, we're all asking you right now. To restore the hearts of the fathers to the sons and restore the hearts of the sons of the father. But Lord, we're asking you right now. This could have never happened in any other time in history. Till there were believers from the east and the west and Christian Arabs and Messianic Jews. Father, we're asking you, please, 
restore us to be a real global family that we would make covenant together to be a family, sons of our heavenly father, following the firstborn son, Yeshua, Jesus, the Messiah. God, I'm asking you to do a miracle today. May it spread out from this prayer across the nations. Father, make us to be a global family in the image of Jesus, the son, and restoring the family of our father in heaven and on earth. Amen. No, I want him to do the Baruch Habav Hashem Adonai that you did at the tent. Get us all to say it. That was so cool. <laughs> all right. We'd like to end with this little chant. You know that. Yeshua said, Matthew 23. Well, actually, he said, by the way, okay, I'll throw in a quick teaching. 15 seconds. Listen quickly. Three prerequisites to the second coming of Jesus. The bride has to make herself ready. Revelation 19, that's us. That's what you do here. You have led the world in that, Mike. Hallelujah. Here I am. The second thing is, of course, Matthew 24, the gospel has to be preached to all the nations. The gospel of the kingdom has to be preached to all the nations before the end will come. And hallelujah, YWAM, the sin, the awakening, the don't. What we did here, that was that. But there was the, uh, there's another prerequisite, and that's what we bring to you. Yeshua said, to the people of Jerusalem. He said, oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you who kill the prophets and stone those who sent to you, how long I've desired to gather you together as a hen gathers a chick under her wings, but you were not willing. Behold, your house, your temple is left desolate to you. Throw it in there for 2,000 years. But you will not see me again until you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And we take that in the positive way. If he won't come until we say that, he will come when we do say that. <laughs> Hallelujah. And that saying is a double saying. For the whole church to say, Maranatha, Maran, Lord, Atta, come, Lord, come, Lord Jesus. And to say that together with the Jewish people saying, Baruch haba b'shem Adonai. Bless us, you comes in the name of the Lord. Last thing, 30 seconds, then we'll say it. You heard me say this, that... We say that in Israel three occasions. Baruch Haba is when you invite someone into your home. We're welcoming Yeshua back to his home, to his family. The second time you say it is at a wedding. When the groom comes into the wedding, the whole, you chant out over him, Baruch Haba B'Shem Adonai. Blessed is he who comes, the groom to take his bride. But the third time that it said, and this is only in the Bible, we don't do it. In the Bible it said, when you crown the king, the son of David, to be king over Jerusalem, you crown him by saying, Baruch Habab, B'Shebanar, come, Lord Yeshua, take your place, your throne in Jerusalem to rule and reign as king. So we're doing those three things. We're welcoming into the family. We're receiving him as the groom to take up his bride. And we're welcoming him back to crown him as king in Jerusalem. Can you remember that? All right. Hallelujah. So we're going to say it three times. Let's just, let's just go over those words again. We'll teach it. You ready? We said, we're going to say, Bless is he who comes in the Lord, the name of the Lord in Hebrew. Baruch. Baruch. Haba. Haba. Hashem. Hashem. Adonai. Adonai. Yeshua. Yeshua. Baruch. Baruch. Haba. Haba. Hashem. Adonai, Adonai Yeshua. Yeshua. That was just practice. Now let's do it three times. Ready? Let's go. With me real strong. Baruch. Baruch. Haba. Haba. Bashem. Bashem. Adonai. Adonai. Yeshua. Yeshua. Baruch. 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 Haba. Haba. Bashem. Bashem. Adonai. Adonai. Yeshua. 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 Baruch. 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 Haba. 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 Bashem. Bashem. Adonai. Adonai. Yeshua. The send week is over with that. Amen. <laughs> Goodbye. Greet one another.
The flood and the sand, we ended right there. Amen. Bless you guys.